All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, welcome to our March 2023 release recap. Um, I'm going to get it kicked off with you, Saz, here. And let me see, hang on just a second. This uh, just popped up a little bit. <laughs> I have a overlay that's a little bigger <laughs> than planned. Um, before I get started, though, I want to mention, um, of course, as we go along, um, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat or, um, you know, if you want to unmute and ask a question, absolutely, um, that, that would be totally fine. So um, just let us know uh, as we go. And um, I'm starting on this uh, release recap page, which, you know, just um, I'm, I'll just go ahead and recap how I got here <laughs> before we get into the actual recap. <laughs> uh, so from our main page, I'm scrolling down to the bottom here to our SSDT meetings and trainings. And um, again, uh, go all the way down and we have calendar year 2023 and then the month. So um, this is our little page where we kind of compiled USAS, USPS, and inventory, um, all the details for you. So um, for USAS, we had two different releases in March, um, this 8.68 and 8.69. And I think it's really funny. You're going to see there's a bit of a theme here as I'm going through these. And what that is, it's really, um, we're kind of gearing up a lot of these things apply to fiscal year end uh, or to budgeting. And so making sure those pieces are in place, um, some of these bug fixes that we've seen in previous years, making sure that those are corrected so that um, so certain things don't happen this year. So, um, so it's really nice to see these on here uh, now and ahead of time. So um, the first one I have is a bug fix that corrected the refund to prevent modifying uh, the transaction if there's a check associated with it. Um, refunds are not modifiable. Um, if the refund check needs to be updated instead, the check can be void and then um, a correct refund issued. So I wanted to take a look at this in the software. Uh, I'm going to transaction refunds. And so what we're looking at here, if I click on one of these, I'm just going to view this one is so I have my refund. And then if I scroll down here, um, when this was when this refund was added, the box was checked to create a check that check detail um, was entered in at that point. Now, as soon as this refund gets saved, the system goes over and uses that information to make a check in the disbursements grid. So um, what we did with this one is um, if you edit now, you'll see all of these details. The only thing is like a description, which doesn't necessarily impact anything as far as like the check, but as far as like accounts, amounts, you know, vendor, like all of that, you can't change on the refund after that initial save because you already have a check with certain information out there. So this just kind of ensures that everything stays matching. And then, you know, if it does need to be changed, there's a process for that where you could actually go to the disbursements grid and use the normal void process on a check and then just create a new dis a new refund with the check. So, so just to kind of safeguard um, with that bug fix. Uh, the next one that I have on here is an improvement to uh, the appropriation resolution report zero balance option. We had this come up um, last year. There were like a couple specific situations um, that I recall um, where if they just had, basically if the um, ending balance came to zero on the account, it was being um, excluded out of um, this one specific version, this fiscal today appropriated uh, appropriation carryover and totals. So where I saw this was that it would be like, you know, maybe it had a carryover encumbrance, but then they um, went ahead and entered like an adjustment to bring that to zero because they didn't want that account to have an expendable amount. But then it wasn't actually being included if they excluded zeros. And that made for a different carryover, which obviously they don't want. So that's corrected. So this version is now consistent with the other versions. I'm um, going periodic appropriation resolution report. 
and then it is um, this version here. And so by default, this report is set to exclude the accounts with zero balances because it's not checked. So it's not including them. And so, you know, last year, so if this came up, then districts would have to, you know, check this option and they get a longer report, which they don't want. So, um, so that is fixed. So that is fixed for this year when they're um, going ahead and running those. Okay. Um, the next one is this one right here, corrected a bug that allowed the July 1st cash balance to display a zero in the specific case where June is closed and the system creates July. So, and this again was like happening in a very specific situation. Um, and essentially what would happen, so if they, if the district is in June getting ready to close their fiscal year, and the July posting period doesn't exist yet. Um, if they close June, then since July's folder wasn't created, when they switch over to July, it was looking like their cash balances were all zero, which obviously that's like kind of scary for them. Um, but the, the figures were there. It was just as far as like how they were showing with the pattern of how those were being closed. This didn't happen too, too often because... Um, a lot of districts do their budgets ahead of time. And if they had posted their budgets, July would have been there and then they wouldn't even, they wouldn't have had this situation. So, you know, if this is one, if this is one that you've heard of, I'm sure you're sitting there going, yay. <laughs> and, and there's a very high chance that some of you might not have run into this luckily. So, um, but that is um, corrected. So they don't like have to create July ahead of time or anything. And then, um, you know, that'll prevent some, um, you know, some worry if like that this had caused previously where now they can just close it. If July is not there when they open it, then their cash balances will be there. So, so that's a good one. I'm, I'm really happy to see that on here for this, um, for this fiscal year. And then um, our last one that I have on here for bug uh, fixes is they corrected a bug on the proposed amounts grid when attempting to apply as temporary or permanent, um, they were getting an error message saying that it required an effective date um, to be in the current fiscal year. So uh, if, if any of you were on my budgeting training that happened in um, February, I did run into this error and, you know, it was, um, it, it's, it's, it was just a bug that we just needed to address. Um, essentially what happened is, um, we did add this error for adjustments because when you're posting through that proposed grid as adjustments, you want to be posting the adjustment to the current fiscal year. And um, we specifically had this come up because like previously we saw some like miss keys where somebody miskeyed the year and then it was like creating different periods. And so the actual error that we added is a really good safeguard for adjustment types. However, the bug was that that had actually gotten applied to the temporary and permanent posting too, um, which in that case, you should definitely be able to post those outside of the fiscal year. So what they did, fixed it right up. So um, now if you are posting temporary or permanent, you can indeed post those now for the start of fiscal year 2024. So um, this bug fix, if you saw it before, you saw it before, now it's gone. If they didn't see it, if they haven't posted their budgets yet or attempted to post their budgets yet, then this changes nothing of like the original process for them. So um, yeah, so that one's all set to go. So I'm glad. Okay, any questions on the bug fixes before we move on to the improvement? All right, so um, I do just have one here because we've been, um, as you can see, very focused on these bugs. Um, but this one, we also went in and improved the message displayed when scenarios are promoted uh, to the proposed amounts. So this is in the budgeting scenarios page when they go to push those forward. And 
we updated this message to include all existing proposed amounts, both expenditure and revenue for clarity. And this is something that we like kind of talk about in the trainings, um, for sure. We have some notes in the documentation, but I know sometimes nothing really hits like, you know, when they're actually doing that step to have that message that spells that out specifically, because, you know, especially with having the tabs for expenditure and revenue on the proposed grid, um, if they're going to be replacing those, you know, that's a really important thing to know. So um, here's what the message looks like now. And um, just make sure that um, that can help as best as possible to make that clear what that step is actually doing. Okay. And then I have one more thing for you here. It's a note. We've had it on both of these release notes, um, but I wanted to just like bring it up here um, just to make sure to like kind of vocalize it for you all um, before it happens. But they added a note. We're going to be removing the obsolete SSDT auditor report bundle in an upcoming release. Um, so this bundle, it's this last one on this list, SSDT audit report bundles. This is under you know, on the actual report bundles page. So last year, so this was what they used to run or like what you may um, have scheduled for uh, the specific auditor reports, but in coordination with AOS, we actually created those audit jobs instead that go directly through the job scheduler. By now, you know, I'm thinking you all probably have been in there and uh, have, you know, scheduled those out in coordination with your districts for the district and the SOC 1 audit job. Um, but now that you have those and those are scheduled, um, this audit report bundle is really obsolete. It's not, I mean, the reports are still still gonna be available in the software, but um, you don't necessarily need to have this bundle out there. So we're gonna take it out. Um, so this is like the heads up, you know, and as far as we're aware, like I don't think that this is anything that anybody would be using for any specific purpose but you know certainly if that differs like let us know um but uh yes so uh and then i have you know details on how to use the audit jobs can be found um and this is linked to that specific documentation so here's uh what that looks like where those are scheduled now okay well that's all i have for you so we're going to use uh switch over to usps here Okay, we will switch gears here. Are you guys? Let me see. I don't think I'm sharing the right screen. Give me one second. Okay. Is everybody seeing my screen okay with the USPS R releases? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. For some reason, it didn't look like I thought it should. Okay, we're going to switch gears, as Amanda said, and talk about um, the two payroll releases that happened um, last month. Um, we just had two regular releases, 6.87 and 6.88. Um, so we're going to go through those changes um, and first talk about the bug fixes. So we had um, some instances where um, districts were reporting they were trying to use that print screen option um, on the compensation screen, and it was failing. It was it wasn't um, completing as expected. So um, the developers were able to you know fix that. So now. Anytime you use that print screen option on the compensation um, record in particular, it should complete as um, expected. So I just wanted to make sure, um, I'm sure you're all aware of where it's at and what I'm talking about. Um, but these print screen options that we've added throughout other core um, screens as well are super helpful. So if you have, you know, we're kind of, you know, gearing 
towards the end of a school year and starting um, another school year, you know, if districts are adding new employees, like over the summer months as they're being hired, um, and they want a means to check um, that information that they've added if they're not using employee onboarding, um, this is a super helpful way for them to be entering that information. You know, if you're like me um, and you like paper, you still like to check things, you know, on on hard copies of, of reports and um, paper, this is a super helpful way to do that. So remember, you do have to be in the view grid or view option, I'm sorry, for this, uh, this option to be available. And then you'll see the print screen um, option here. So we did have some questions. You know, people go into the edit um, option and, and expect that um, print screen option to be available there. You do have to be in the just, you know, viewing that record. Um, so here's what we're talking about. And again, it gives you that one page um, look um, at the way the record was entered. And you can check, you know, look over things before, um, you know, you're actually pulling that information into a payroll. Um, the next um, item that was corrected was um, an error, that zero exception error to the afford report. So this was only happening when a certain situation um, took place. And that was if you were running um, the afford report for a specific month and an employee was only involved in one payroll within that time period. Um, the employee also had to have a compensation calendar start date that was after the payroll stop date. So it was kind of very specific and it you know, obviously didn't happen all the time, um, but because of the calculations that the program was doing um, in dividing, doing some division that um, resulted in zero, it threw that zero exception error um, that's now been corrected. Um, so that, you know, no division is going to take place if there are zero months, um, you know, in that calculation. So um, users should no longer receive that error um, and the report will complete um, as normal. Um, they also made some updates to what we call the stream progress indicator. And that's simply that Think of it as when um, you go to a generator report, that little icon that comes up um, and that just spins in a circle over and over and over again until um, the um, you know, report completes basically or the, the submission file completes. Um, the, this was corrected from just indefinitely spinning. Um, and this was happening mainly on the SERS per pay report. Um, so now when you generate the submission file, um, you know, you should see that progress indicator come up and spin. And then when the submission file is completed, that um, spinner will stop spinning um, like it should. Next um, was an improvement to um, the way the custom fields um, type of code that sort order was happening. So let me just show you quickly what I'm talking about. So if I go to a cus the custom fields, it's under, um, under system, I have one of these defined as type of code, and I've actually added some codes down below. So I'm gonna add another code just so you can see that these um, now, stay and will be listed in alphabetical order. Um, so I'm gonna just put jelly beans going along with our Easter theme here. And I'm gonna put um, uh, I'll just move something up here. All right, so now we're gonna save that. And you can see even in the code order here, um, you know, they're they're in alphabetical order. So when I go then to add that or define that code on a specific employee, in this case, it's on the employee record. So I'm gonna go to that payroll code one. And you can see here, that's you know, the custom field that we've, we've created. 
um, with those different options to select from. And when I choose the drop down, you can see these are also in alphabetical order. So prior to this, they were it was in a random order. So if um, a district had you know multiple and even you know options that you had to use you know to scroll down even further off of what's displayed here, um, you would have to scroll through that list to find you know that right option to select. And now they're in alphabetic order, so you can easily go down through the list and say, you know, it starts with J. Oh, yeah, there's jelly beans. I can select that. OK, so should be super helpful, you know, when you're you're using those custom fields with that code type um, to be able to find those. Next, um, we made a, an improvement to the quarter report. In particular, that 941 section that prints, you know, it's towards the bottom of the report um, to now include board pickup adjustments. So prior to this um, update, those were being omitted and we had several reports of this. Um, and so those that has finally been corrected. So now, you know, rest assured that those board pickup adjustments will be included in that 941 total section. Uh, moving along, we had um, a, uh, an enhancement or a change to the leave projection report. So this wasn't really um, a bug per se, but it was actually causing the report to not um, complete. Um, and this happened when an employee had an, an, a full dock. So an employee was docked their full um, pay. They had absences. So the leave projection report, you know, that's trying to go out and give back that salary account that was originally charged and then charge the benefit, the associated benefit account, um, the amount of that absence. So in this case, you know, if an employee is fully docked, there's no amount to charge. Um, so it was causing the report to fail. So now instead, instead of the report failing, it's actually gonna just include um, an informational message. And then that informational message is listed, um, you know, right under the, right here under the, the bullet. And it'll say that the total account charges is zero for that payroll, and it cannot calculate an amount for the leave projection. Um, and we did add a note here because we thought just adding an informational message might still cause some um, concern. So we did add, you know, took that one step further and added that note that no action is required. There's really nothing that you can do um, because there's no amount to charge for that absence when an employee is fully docked. Okay. I'm not sure how often that actually happens, you know, when you have absences for an employee that was fully docked, um, but there, there were cases and we, you know, had the, those reported. So we've, you know, allowed the software to um, take that into consideration. Um, next, we added um, an improvement to the um, pre-posting of the payroll item detail report versus the actual posting of the payroll when it comes to the 400 and the 450 payroll items, when you have employees that have increased compensation. So um, maybe some of you noticed or had reports um, from your districts that, hey, those two reports aren't matching the pre-payroll um, item detail report versus the posted payroll, I payroll item detail report. Um, you know, those two should match. Um, when it comes to increased compensation or, or any time. Um, we've now made that change to that particular report and you should see no differences um, when it comes to those employees that have <clears throat> um, increased compensation. And then lastly was just a change to um, payroll items when um, there were no end dates on those payroll items. It was causing issues you know, all throughout um, the application, 
so updates were made and you know those issues should, should be resolved and you should, you should no longer see any problems um, and that's you know obviously very common so um, they shouldn't okay are there any questions when it comes to um, any of the bug fixes okay I'm so sorry I just saw somebody said that the Oh, is, let me see if I can make this a little bigger. I apologize. I did not see there. Is that better? <laughs> I'm sorry, Rhonda. Just speak up. I'm terrible at looking at the chat. <laughs> I apologize. Hopefully you can see that now. Okay. Moving on to the improvements then. Um, we did, um, for those of you that, um, you know, have been working with salary notices, you know that, um, you know, we we added that uh, availability um, several releases ago, and we had lots and lots of requests to add other additional um, information to those notices. Um, you know, every district wants something a little different, um, and that's understandable. So we've added, as you can see, several different fields. Um, properties that can be added to those salary notices. Um, when you go to customize that, um, we've listed all those here. Please know that we um, have received several other requests for enhancements to have uh, additional properties added to those salary notices. And we will be you know, taking those into consideration and hopefully getting those available to you um, sooner than later, because we know that districts are going to um, you know, want to start getting those in place um, before June rolls around. So all of those new values um, are listed here. Um, I did want to point out a couple things um, since we're talking about salary notices, um, and that is um, the um, area in the new contracts chapter. Um, if you click on the salary notices um, section, we do have um, a section here that talks about creating salary notices. Um, and then if I scroll down, I'm sorry, am I making you dizzy here? A, a section about customizing the salary notices. So we've listed all of those field, those merge field names um, in a table here. And you know, these these control then, you know, that merge happening and those values being placed on the notice itself. So these are very, very, very important. Um, so you wanna make sure they're exactly as listed you know, in this table. Um, we do also in this area have um, a clickable link that will allow you to download the default salary notice. So you don't have to start from scratch. Um, use this link here, um, use that as your starting point. Um, and then, you know, go through and add, um, based on the table below, um, any of the, that, you know, new information, those new properties that your district might want included in their notice. Um, we also have a link here <clears throat> that's going to step you through the process of actually customizing the, the, the form. So it's going to step you through, um, again, we have you know, just to point out, we have the default notices at the top, and then it's going to step you through the actual process of inserting that merge field, you know, um, how to add those fields um, and editing a field and so forth. Um, so if you're starting to work with your districts on creating those notices, you know, go to that chapter, um, that new contract chapter and go to that salary notice section. And I think you're going to find it super helpful. Um, we've tried to, you know, put a lot of detail and be very specific in, in outlining those steps because we know it's very um, confusing. Michelle, you know, I, um, if you were at the um, OECN United conference last week, she also did um, a, in her session, she went through um, salary notices and customizing a form. So hopefully um, between you know, that session, um, the information in the chapter, along with, um, I wanted to point out that um, 
we do have a session coming up on April 21st that's covering new contracts along with salary notices. Um, we've discussed as a team, and because these two topics are, um, you know, beasts in themselves, um, we're going to actually split these out. So um, just make note that on April 21st, um, Andrea is going to be covering a review of new contracts. So that's what the session is going to be focused on. And then we are going to actually put together a, a video um, stepping you through salary notices, you know, everything you need to know about salary notices, customizing salary notices, um, and so forth. Um, and we hope to have that video out then before um, this training on the 21st, so that if you do have any questions, you know, we can answer those at that time. But just know that the this this session is going to focus um, on new contracts, and then we will have that um, training video available for you to watch over and over and over at your leisure. Um, if you have any questions, you know, you can pause that and and rewind it. So we thought that that might be a better approach, um, and for sake of time, um, not taking up too much of your morning, um, we're going to break those two out. Okay. All right. So look for that um, in the near future, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that's all about salary notices. Um, moving right along then, um, we have um, an update to the pay report. The um, payroll item configuration, when it prints on the pay payroll report, you know, we only have so much room. Um, and I'll just bring up the pay report here so you can understand what I'm talking about. So this abbreviation section here on the report, <clears throat> excuse me, we only have so many, so many characters um, to print in that space. Um, previously, if this abbreviation was exceeded that um, space, which is eight characters, it would just print a series of dots. So not very helpful, right? Like, you know, we don't know if, um, you know, this Ohio state tax, if it just printed three dots, what, what um, deduction is that payroll item is that referring to? Um, so now we have um, an update in the software that if that abbreviation exceeds that eight characters, it actually will print the eight characters followed by a series of three dots. So <clears throat> just to point out a little further what I'm talking about, if I go to the payroll item configuration, which is where the abbreviation is pulling from to print on that report, this field here um, is what we're talking about. So you can see here that I have an abbreviation that is, you know, exceeds that eight characters um, that will print um, in on my pay report. So again, when I run the pay report, if any abbreviation exceeds that eight characters, it's going to print those eight characters. So print all it can in that field, followed by three dots. Okay, so it prints something versus basically nothing. All right, so hopefully that will be way more helpful. Um, next then is an update to um, the SERS, um, actually to direct deposits um, when it comes to um, sending out multiple notices um, to the same address. So this all came about um, with the change to SERS and the fact that they now are requiring um, an, a, a personal email. So basically they wanted a way to, um, you know, I, to get in contact with employees after they've left um, their employment. So say somebody retires, somebody changes um, districts or leaves the district, you know, how can SERS get a hold of them? So they're now requiring um, a, another email address outside of their work email. So this is um, the field, other email address is what we're using to identify that um, outside email. 
I can show you that here real quick. So if I go to an employee and I go down here to um, this contact section, there's a primary email, a secondary email, and an other email. So this here is the field that we're now pulling from when it comes to reporting those new hires to SERS, okay? So you can see on the SERS new hire report um, that this email field is now included, okay? So what was happening or what districts were not liking is the fact that if this primary email address is the same as the other email address, it was sent sending an email notice twice. So these email addresses would be the same. Employees were getting a notice twice, you know, to that to that same email, but but not once, twice. So it does cause some confusion, and we understand. So now um, we've made an update to the software that if those email addresses are the same or if it finds a duplicate email, it will only send the notification once, okay? Now I did put a note here that, you know, it's not something we recommend um, that you, you know, use case sensitive emails, but it, the system does allow it. So if they were to enter two emails and the only difference is the case, you know, uppercase, lowercase, the, the system is going to see that as two different email addresses and it will send the notification twice. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. I'm not sure, you know, how often that happens, but, you know, just a note that it does take, take in um, to consideration, you know, upper and lower cases. So those do have to be absolutely identical for the, for the notice not to be sent um, multiple times. Okay. All right. So while we're talking about SERS new hire and the new hire report, um, we also then included that email address, which I just pointed out um, on um, the actual report, as well as on the grid. So if I would go to reports, and I'm going to go to SERS reporting, SERS new hire report, you're also going to see that um, other email listed on the grid. So, um, you know, if one is missing, you can see here one is, um, SERS is not going to accept this file, okay? This is a required field, so it does have to be populated and, and included in um, that new hire submission form when it's uploaded to ESERS, okay? All right. And then lastly, um, users can now add payables adjustments by typing in the code um, and or select it from the drop-down menu. So before um, you had to go to that drop-down menu and actually select it from there, um, now you have the ability to you know, enter it either way. So if I go to processing, process outstanding payables, and I go to the payables adjustment tab, when I go to create these adjustments, I can actually start typing in a code and it's gonna find the appropriate code or I can select from the dropdown. And this matches you know, other behavior throughout the, the application. So it's not something new, it's just we updated this particular um, area in the application to, to act the same as other areas that you're, you know, they're, you're used to, how you're used to entering um, the information. Okay. All right. That is all I have. I'm just going to check the chat real quick. Oh, great. Good. Yeah. I know we had a lot of, a lot of requests for, you know, wanting that to be available. So all right, seeing nothing else in the chat, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Good morning, everybody. 
I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. You guys can see this okay? Okay. Um, just a couple of um, uh, bug fixes and improvements that were made in inventory in the month of March. We had a regular um, release 1.33.0, and we 